all right. I'm wearing my lucky undies, the same ones, <laughs> same ones I wore on the day we won the yes vote. So, courage, the ability to overcome fear and risk one's personal safety or sometimes even one's life is recognised as one of humankind's greatest virtues. We certainly appreciate its usefulness. We are a fragile species and we face many threats, not least of all from ourselves. So courage is essential for survival. Most of us value courage and would like to have more of it. But how should we go about getting it? Is courage something that we are born with or something that we learn? Now, I am certainly not the first person to ask this question. Everyone from Socrates to Putin has sought <laughs> to understand, maximise and exploit courage. Now, full disclosure, I am not an expert. I am a comedian. <laughs> but I am descended from a long line of very brave people, of which I am not one. <laughs> from the moment Hitler invaded Poland at the start of World War II, every member of my father's family, including my grandmother and my aunt, was heavily involved in the resistance. They were active combatants, they smuggled guns into the Jewish ghetto, and throughout the war they hid and assisted Jewish people. Had they been caught, they would have been killed, if they were lucky. Much more likely, they would have been tortured. All my life I have wondered, would I have the courage to do what they did? I hoped I would, but I feared I would not. Seeking answers, I treated my family as a kind of uh, living instruction manual. I would pester them, asking why they did what they did and where did their courage come from. But they would look back at me with bewildered incomprehension. They had no insight into their own behaviour. In fact, they didn't even consider their actions to be courageous. The best they could offer was that they did what they did because it was the right thing to do. This mantra was so automatic as to be almost meaningless. But perhaps that is the point. Because when the time comes, there is no time for reflection, only reflex. And their moral code bred into them over generations of invasion was like a well-trained muscle primed to take the right action. Even so, there is no guarantee. My father would always say to me, Magda, until you are there, you do not know what you will do. And sure enough, when the time finally came for the test of my courage, it was not in a form I expected or wanted. It was not for a noble cause of which I could be proud. It was a test of me, of my courage to be who I truly am. I began to realise I was gay when I was about five or six years old, a tender age. And at first I felt okay about this. But I quickly learnt that being same-sex attracted was not only not okay, it was a sin. It was, in fact, the very opposite of the right thing to do. It is hard, perhaps impossible, to stand up for something that you are ashamed of. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, to be clear, I am capable of courage. <laughs> when I was 19, I worked in a women's refuge at a time when there was no police protection. And when a bomb exploded in my street, I was one of the few who, who ran towards the flames to offer assistance. But for myself, I had no courage. It just evaporated in a cloud of shame and excruciating shyness. What I did have, however, was the desire to be courageous. So I set about learning. 
To be honest, my father was no help. His utter fearlessness only served to discourage me. And in fact, growing up listening to him and his friends talking about the war shattered any romantic Hollywood illusions I had about heroism. I was schooled in its true cost. I saw lives ruined, blighted by futile, sometimes misdirected acts of valour. Courage, doing the right thing, can even have monstrous, unintended consequences. One particular story haunts me. A friend of my father never got over the suicide of his elderly parents, who killed themselves rather than risk divulging his name to the Gestapo under torture. So, first I would have to challenge this cross-generational fear. Although based in reality, cruel, harrowing reality, was it realistic or even relevant to the here and now? Secondly, I began studying in a very informal way people who overcame their fear. Now, <clears throat> it wasn't a terribly conscious process. It was more a matter of just paying attention, of noticing. I watched biographies on the History Channel. I would look for clues in magazines and memoirs and movies and scholarly articles and self-help books. Slowly, over time, I nourished and cultivated my courage. Over the years, I came up to friends and family and colleagues. I did decades of therapy to overcome my internalised homophobia. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as I became more famous, I pushed myself to step from behind the mask of my characters and appear more in public as my real self. For example, I became the face of Jenny Craig. Lost a lot of weight and then put all of the weight back on, very publicly. But through that process, I learned that I was able to survive public humiliation. More than that, I began to correct my faulty thinking. I realised that not only did many people not care, they empathised. The world, it turns out, is full of yo-yo dieters. <laughs> Finally, in February 2012, I came out live on national television in support of same-sex marriage. And from there, my courage snowballed. And the more I did, the more I realised that courage is not a state of being. It is a way of doing. It was in the act of doing something brave that I became brave. And it changed me in ways I could never have anticipated. Firstly, my cognitive abilities actually improved and became more accurate. I was able to perceive that while homophobia is very real, it is not everywhere. Secondly, I was less affected by those people who actually are homophobic. It wasn't that I became recklessly indifferent, it was more like I sort of developed an immunity and the virus of homophobia lost its power to corrupt my operating system. Thirdly, my desire and ability to fight for what is right grew stronger. Some people suggested, in light of my family, that it was in my blood, giving me a kind of genetic edge like Michael Phelps' enormous arm span. <laughs> more and more studies are confirming the existence of intergenerational trauma. Is there, I wondered, such a thing as intergenerational courage? Well, recently I had my DNA tested and it turns out that there is a gene nicknamed the warrior gene. I don't have it. <laughs> In fact, what I do have is called the warrior gene. <laughs> uh, this apparently means that I'm good at multitasking but prone to psychosocial anxiety. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. Um, 
Now, had I actually been paying attention during any of my philosophy degree, I would have known. <laughs> oh, education was free, you know. I'm <laughs> but look at me using it now. Um, I would have known that Aristotle had, in fact, answered my question two and a half thousand years ago. He believed that virtues are not qualities that we are born with, but habits that we acquire, and that we learn them by doing them. Quote, just as men become builders by building and liar players by playing the liar. Had I known that, perhaps I would have treated myself more kindly. Instead of calling myself a coward, perhaps I might have thought that courage was, in part, just a skill I had not yet learned. In August of 2017, after 14 years and 22 bills, the chronically deadlocked Australian Parliament decided to put same-sex marriage to a popular vote. Very quickly, the arguments became vicious and bitterly divisive. The government opted to take a hands-off approach and in the moral vacuum created by this total absence of political leadership, my long-standing fame led to me becoming a kind of public, unofficial face of the Yes campaign. <laughs> Despite it looking like fun, it was actually a very daunting responsibility. It would be terrible if we lost, not just in Australia. A victory for the no side might also bolster discrimination in countries where LGBTQI people are persecuted and killed. But even if we won, would the gains be worth the cost of dragging the, the LGBTQI community through a very damaging, ugly debate? Civil rights struggles are long and hard and never fully won. And over the course of their journey, they require many types of courage at different stages. Sometimes fearless individuals are needed to pave the way. But at other times, what are needed are the gentle arts of conciliation and unification. I don't regret my fear. It taught me humility, patience, and compassion for suffering. And perhaps that was just the right kind of courage that was needed for that moment. I knew I was gay when I was five years old. That was 1966. Terrified and alone, I saw my fear and I called myself a coward. 52 years later, I would never ever claim to have the courage of my ancestors. But with persistence, willingness and a shift of understanding, I was able to increase the small amount I did have to become one of the most effective campaigners for LGBTQI rights in this country. Courage may be crucial to our survival, but it is powerful magic, and it serves us best when it is placed in a constellation of other virtues. Without kindness and common sense, it can be cruel and reckless. So, if we are to be brave, perhaps our first brave act should be to look with intelligence and compassion at our cowardice. And just a quick postscript. I misjudged my father. After he died, I came across a quote he had written in Latin, Nec Hercules contra pluris. It's an old Polish proverb, and it means, even Hercules is afraid when confronted with many enemies. Because, as it turns out, my father didn't have the warrior gene either. Thank you.